Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Kempton Sarah. I'm a partner at Garfunkel Wild in the healthcare and corporate practice groups. I primarily focus on transactional and regulatory matters and deal with uh, regular day to day issues for all types of healthcare providers. Today, I'm honored to present with two powerhouses in the healthcare transaction world, Bob Getling and Matt Serrells, who are here to discuss consolidation in physician practices and ASCs today, tomorrow, and next year. First, I'll ask Bob to introduce himself and then Matt, and then we will get into the presentation. Thank you, Kim. Um, my name is Bob Getling. I am a principal at the Bloom organization. Um, Bloom uh, was founded in 1990, um, focused, it were a, were a specialty uh, investment bank and a uh, licensed broker dealer specializing in physicians, physician practices, physician owned ASCs and other ancillaries. Myself, um, I've been in what I call the uh, doctor business of uh, working with docs on, on the buy side and the sell side for the last uh, almost 30 years. Um, and have seen a lot of the pendulum swings back and forth in that time. Thanks, Bob. I'm Matt Searles with Merit Healthcare. I started the firm in 2001. Uh, prior to that, I had a private equity investment banking background and actually started Merit as a developer and manager of surgery centers. And that, that company still exists today, although I spend you know, primarily most of my time in the investment banking uh, area of our business. So we, you know, like Bob, have kind of worked in that space where we're, you know, dealing primarily with physician owners, but also, you know, other types of ancillary businesses like urgent care or things of that nature. Uh, and, you know, we, we've, uh, Bob and I have worked together for many years and seen a lot of stuff together and looking forward to the panel today. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, and actually, I'm going to start with you, Matt. Um, could you just give us a quick overview of the medical practice and ASC market as we get into the fourth quarter of this year? Sure. So the, the first observation I'd make is uh, that it's just extraordinarily busy, right? I've never seen uh, the market, you know, this, uh, uh, this full of transactions, you know, um, people use the word frothy or lots of different ways to describe it, but it's been incredibly busy, you know, even to the point where, uh, you know, I've never had this happen in my career, but it's hard to get firms to do quality of earnings and, and, and legal work sometimes can be a touch delayed. And Kim, you might be able to uh, comment on that, but it, it not uh, ours. ours is never delayed. <laughs> well, just, just because there's, there's not uh, that many good quality lawyers to work on it and there's just uh, more deals than there's ever been. And so uh, we're seeing that con continued consolidation, um, you know, driven by, you know, difficulty to remain independent. That, that continues to be a factor in all these deals. Um, I think on the on the buyer side, you're seeing fewer quality opportunities, right? We always say that in in the case of surgery centers, there were, you know, there are six thousand of them, there won't be six thousand more. Or we're kind of dealing in a space now where we're, you know people are hunting down these good opportunities, and uh, there is some growth there that's driving that. You know, migration of cases into lower cost environments, cardiac cases, spine joint cases, things that we hadn't seen, uh, you know, five years ago. So it's just you know extraordinarily busy, and the same on the practice side. Uh, it remains very difficult to operate independently. And so there's a real, I think, bipartisan emphasis on consolidation uh, being pushed by, you know, really both sides of the aisle and payers and all the people that matter. So if I had to describe, uh, I had to describe the market, I'd say it's really extraordinarily busy and um, there's a lot of deals being done now. Uh, and Bob, do you think that that's going to continue into, I assume you agree with Matt and you're seeing the same. Um, and do you think that's going to continue into 2022? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I completely agree with Matt that uh, 2021, you know, it's funny, 2020 was, we were all scared to death. Nobody knew what was going to happen. We were sitting around trying to reinvent ourselves. You know, it was, it was a completely, and then the end of 2020 and really 2021 hit. And I think as, as Matt said early on, all of us, you know, that do deals in, 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 in what I call the doctor business, 
um, it just exploded. And early on, and you know, as, as Matt said last year, you or this year, we knew this was going to be a, you know, this was going to be a marathon year, and it was going to go, you know, it was going to get busier and busier and busier until we get to December. Now we're in, you know, Q4, and you know, it, it, it everything is exactly as we predicted. Um, but it, but now, as you know, nobody has a spare moment. But if they do. Or when they're laying in bed, they wonder what's 2022 going to look like. Are we going to go back to 2020? Or you know, is everybody going to go oh, relax now and take a breath? I don't think so. Um, and 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 the, the the reason I say that, and I tell you know, we're we're at the point now in the year where um, you know physician clients that come to us now and say, hey, we want to you know we want to do something with our practice, we want to do something with our surgery center, with our cath lab, with whatever. Um, it, it, there's no way they're getting anything done by the end of the year. Right. So now we are into 2022. And what I've seen is that the real driver, yeah, there was all the Washington tax stuff and all that about the, the driver to, for, for all the business in 2021. Everybody said it was to get it done by the end of the year from a, you know, from a capital gains tax perspective. But what I see now and, and Matt probably just seen the same thing. There's just as many new clients coming in now that are going to be 2022 deals um, and they're not coming in for tax reasons that's not their driver it's you know the other more material reasons so i don't i don't you know I, I will it slow down maybe a little bit yeah but i still think it's going to be you know 2022 is going to be you know crazy busy just because there's so many opportunities and um, I guess I'll go back to back to you, Matt. So I think I know the answer already, but do you see the transaction volume back at pre-COVID levels um, were even better than, you know, 2018? Yeah, I'd say better. You know, I, I, Bob and I talked about this. You know, I, I, uh, I always say better lucky than good, right? We chose a profession where maybe there was a six, eight week lag in deals when COVID first started happening and there was relative uncertainty about what it would mean. Uh, and then you know, transaction volume just really, really picked up. And so we haven't really seen, um, and I don't think it, at Bloom either, really any kind of drop off in, in volume. And it's, uh, you know, I can't say that, we, that we, we saw COVID coming and said, hey, let's jump in that space. But uh, we're fortunate to be in it. And it's just, I, I don't see it abating at all. And to echo Bob's comment, right? I mean, the last capital gains change we had, I think was 2012, and it had absolutely no impact on healthcare M&A and neither will this one. Uh, I don't. I think people may have jumped in at some level, uh, concerned about it, but it, it shouldn't factor in to whether or not you do a deal, and I don't, I don't think it will. Um, okay, thank you both. Um, I'll go back to you, Bob. What, uh, in terms of buyers for of ASCs and, and practices, what's the primary, I guess group of buyers that you see as the most active? Is it private equity or health systems or payers? Yeah, so there's a little bit of a, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a difference between the ASCs and the practices, starting with the ASCs, you know, the same buyers that we've been dealing with for, you know, years, the ASC management companies, the health systems, um, you know, still the most active and probably dominant. <clears throat> the private equity folks that have been, you know, started through the practice business, um, getting in in the last few years are now doing, you know, surgery centers too. Um, so uh, they've kind of, you know, become a staple to the to the to the buyers uh, for ASCs. And in addition, what what we're what we're seeing now, and and I think Matt will <clears throat> will will agree with this, that we're seeing a lot of joint ventures. You know, they're getting this as the sophistication level of doing surgery centers, you know, continues to evolve. Um, you're getting, uh, you know, hospitals and private equity uh, together and, you know, physicians. And so you're seeing a lot of different, um, a lot of different participants in ASC deals, which again is exciting because it creates, you know, they're not, they're not coming into a certain party. New party is not coming into an ASC transaction just because they want to, they're doing it because they bring value. And so then it increases and it has the ability to increase the value of the surgery center on the practice side. Is still, you know, the last year or two, three has been dominated um, by the private equity groups and the private equity platforms. But make no mistake about it, the health systems, um, the you know, even the payers to some extent are you know are in that you know every everybody when it comes to a physician practices, most people agree that that's where the care is delivered by the physician. So you know nobody wants to be blocked out of that, including the payers. And so I think you're seeing a lot of you know a lot of different strange. Um, combinations of partners on doing the practice deals too. 
And Matt, what when you are thinking about the world of sort of the available sellers out there, not necessarily available, but the most willing and um, interested sellers, who, what are you seeing? Is it more um, large practices or smaller practices with older doctors who might want to retire? Um, is it multi-specialty, single specialty, or just a big mix of all of that? So I think it's a big mix, but for the, for the types of deals that, that Bob and I would like to do, you know, in our firms, what we're looking for are folks that look out in the market, have some scale, but understand that they need to be part of something larger to go at risk, to be able to bend the cost curve, to be able to operate at lower, you know, overhead levels and, and integrate into what has, you know, really started to evolve is, you know, clearly the, the, the winning model or, or the, the model that um, is being encouraged by payers and, and, and federal government and uh, making it difficult on, on smaller practices. So I, I think all of the above are interested in it, but ideally our, our client is, you know, uh, probably, a, you know, 50 to 75 million or up uh, practice. It's gonna have a dozen or so members um, most typically, they do become specialty practices, but certainly there are some primary care opportunities that are valuable as well. Um, so while all our firms may focus on some of the larger deals, I think it, it, uh, the, the, the factors that are driving consolidation and need to, to uh, be part of larger system, uh, that, that affects everybody. And uh, for both of you, I guess, Bob, first, do you think... Um, we're seeing valuations at what I would call an all-time high when it comes to practices and surgery centers. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I always, I have a little bit of, I'm a little bit of a, I have a different answer to that. And when, when everyone always asks, oh, or, or, you know, what are multiples? Doctors, you know, they, they're always, why are the multiples going up? Are they going down? Are they staying the same? Um, my answer is always, you know, I, I don't know, but, there, but I do know this, that it's driven by supply and demand. Right. You know, if there is a greater demand and whether it be ASCs or practices, if there's a greater demand than there is a supply, the price is going to go up. Right. The multiples are going to go up. If the reverse happens, it's going to go down. So I think the, 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 the operative thing to look at there is, you know, both of those. How many centers, you know, are out there that haven't on, on the ASC side? How many centers haven't done a deal? Right. You know, if that universe is getting smaller, um, then uh, the, you know, regardless of what the demand um, is for the centers, the price, the evaluate valuations are going to go up. Um, and I think that's the dynamic we've seen on the on the surgery center side over the last couple of years. Um, you know, where it goes, will that, you know, will that supply continue to decrease and the demand stay there or will the demand start to, you know, move over to some other things? I don't know. Um, on the practice side, it, 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 I think it's a little bit more, um, you know, fluid as to the situation, of, at least from a supply and demand perspective. The demand, you know, we keep saying, can you get any higher? And um, I don't know, maybe, you know, if it does, that could push some of the stuff up there higher. But the, on the practice side, I think the thing that we're with some of the crazy valuations we've seen, you know, especially as Matt alluded to in primary care, um, you know, is that sustainable? Can people get a return on investment paying that high? I don't know. We'll see. And, you know, at some point it's going to get to a, you know, to a, a high enough multiple to where if a return can't be obtained, then it's a bad deal. Yeah. yeah, I think on the ASC side, you start to see some scarcity um, that drives, you know, the supply and demand curve in a particular direction, and it's contributed to higher multiples. I don't think there's scarcity on the practice side, but um, there are is a relative scarcity of platform deals where you might find a practice that's large enough, has professional management in place, and is ready today to go start absorbing other practices. And that might contribute uh, to it as well. But overall a sense on the practice side that you know consolidation has to occur um, that it's going to take a certain form and that the first players to really be able to get and create scale are going to you know, create a lot of value for themselves and um, you know ultimately lower that cost curve as well right because we see you know, two primary problems with our healthcare system you know it's a great system but no, no one flies to london or paris for cancer or orthopedic care right they come here so what's the problem it's not available to everybody, that's a problem, which you know Bob and I can't solve. But what we can help solve is uh, to lower the overall costs by helping consolidation occur, um, and that's that's something that uh, I think is, is recognized as a as a solve here. Moving cases into these environments, consolidating these smaller players, 
Um, and that that that's all kind of working together to to drive a, you know strong multiples. We, we are you know aware of potential you know increases in cost of capital right coming potentially, but you know almost impossible to predict, uh, and and it's probably also hard to tell whether that'll you know have any meaningful impact on multiples. And, and, and Kim, if I could follow on to what Matt said, where he, you know, the scarcity issue on practices that he mentioned, and again, both Matt and I, we love the, you know, bigger is better from our perspective, obviously, uh, you know, the, 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 physician groups with 20, 30, 50, a hundred docs, you know, are our favorite, but to Matt's point, there aren't very many of those or, you know, many, very many of them left. However, the smaller, the ones are the onesie twosies, you know, the three, four, five docs, they have as, you know, uh, as, as high of an interest or potentially even higher to do something, you know, they're the ones that are really getting burdened with all the changes um, in, in all the increased costs and all that. And so uh, we found that, you know, that a lot of our phone ringing off the hook are those smaller groups and, you know, they need our help, um, you know, as much if not more than the bigger groups. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen quite a few um, what I would consider you know medium sized transactions, but but you know doctors two three doctors, um, but but they you know they bring value because of their reputation and then you know they're some of some of the more I guess expensive specialties I'll say like plastic surgery and dermatology and um, you know they they they've been selling for more than I would think, <laughs> um, at least what I've seen. Sure. Um, Matt, Bob uh, alluded to this before, but have you seen any changes in the actual structure of transactions or desired structure of transa transactions because of the proposed tax changes um, or just tax driven in general? Yeah, I, I think there's a structure that makes sense, right? Where um, there may be some capital event on the front end, but the physicians and the investor are very much aligned uh, with ownership of a, of a common entity moving forward. I, I think that that structure uh, makes sense, has made sense, has a proven track record, will continue. I don't think it's really impacted by, by taxes. And, uh, you know, another, another one of these things that's impossible pr to predict, but, you know, taking the time and care to do the right deal at the right pace is more important than trying to save 4% on capital gains tax increases. Um, and I think most people agree with that. I didn't notice I didn't say all, but most. I don't know. Some of the doctors might not agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, I think they're, yeah. Okay. Listen, doctors are no different than anyone else. There's always those folks out there. They're kind of just focused on what's right, right in front of them. Uh, but I think for the most part, they, uh, they understand that. Yeah, but it's interesting. It's interesting, Matt, that you say that because, and I'm, and I'm sure you're going to nod your head on this also. The docs, to me, when when a when a client, when a physician client is just totally focused, or as several were earlier this year, on capital gains arbitrage, right? That's the you know, like that was the only that was the first, second, third reason that they were interested. Um, what what happens is you you know we we sense early on they really don't have you know they're they're doing the right thing for maybe not the right reason and they need to go in going through the whole process that we take them through they then start seeing some of the other that those other elements and then by the time the deal you know a, a transaction actually gets completed there's four or five other things that that you know that they're that were more important by the time they closed than the tax thing, but that's, but it started being, you know, that tunnel vision and going through the processes helped educate them and see that, wow, there, it really isn't a tax play because as, as Matt can tell you too, you know, doing this, you know, a, a physician on his ASC or on practice, whatever it may be, making a decision for a, you know, just because of a tr tax arbitrage in, you know, this current year, probably not the, you know, a, 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 a enough of a reason to do it. Yeah, I mean, the, the initial, it's interesting, the initial announcement that they were going to try to raise cap gain to 40%. Well, I mean, I think that got people's attention. But of course, that being just an impossible event that will never occur because it benefits or it harms the wealthiest in our society. So we can be sure it'll never happen. Um, not to make a political comment, but uh, <laughs> some, some, just something, much, something you, know, <laughs> you know, who always wins in the end, right? And I, that might be my Northeast liberal background, but uh, 
<laughs> I, I I knew when it as soon as it was announced, it was it was you know a laughable goal. It's going to go up by a few points. That's it, and I think people are realizing that. Um, and I don't know if you had any any um, experience with the. Uh, it was they were going to raise it retroactively, um, like to September or something. People are like rushed to 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 get in before this date that was just a imaginary, time was yeah. by imaginary date that I don't even know if it's constitutional to, to do that. But it's, um, it's happened. It's happened. But it's, I know it's it has not, happened. It's not yeah. typical. And uh, again, no reason to look. I think if from my point of view, I hope Bob, if you agree, if someone had said to me, Matt, I don't care what you have to do, get me a deal done by the end of the year, this year, you know, it being October 20th. I think my response to that would be whatever you save in taxes, you will most certainly lose in all sorts of other deals. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so exactly we're, not, right. we're not doing it, <laughs> you know. Exactly right. Um, actually, that's a perfect transition to the next question, which is, um, I guess I'll go back to you, Bob. Uh, what is the primary motivation? Is it besides taxes? Um, is it you know just monet instant monetization? Um, or what are some of the other primary motivations for selling? Yeah, I, I, and I again, I, I, I in my mind, I simplify that down. I think there's whether it be the surgery centers or the practices or any other of the ancillary businesses that the that physicians own. There's three. You know, there's three it, 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 buckets of of reasons, and and the first one, you know, which is which is number one, I don't think is never not going to be number one is money, cash. You know, take some chips off the table. You know, that's a, that, that that's a always a definite driver. Um, the second one um, is that, that that's relatively new in the last couple of years is the you know I call it betting on the stock, the equity play that private equities brought in, um, and there have been already. You know, uh, some physicians, uh, quite a few that have done very, very well on the equity component of a private equity deal. And that's very attractive to physicians because they look at it as, oh, I don't have to do another case or see another patient. And I can make that much money. I like that, you know, that, uh, that the equity part. Um, but then the third part, <clears throat> which I happen to believe is the most important, is the what's right for the business and the future, you know, of the, of the, of the practice of the center of the market, whatever. Um, and I think that strategic um, driver is, you know, again, as we said earlier, um, I have very few physicians come into call us and want to do a deal and say the main driver is strategic, <clears throat> but by the end of the process, I think they're, you know, very often times very focused on that strategic. So again, I put any of the motivations, regardless of whether it's surgery centers or, or, or practices in one of, you know, in those three buckets in a combination of them. Matt, Bob, Bob kind of glossed over this, but um, would you sort of explain a little bit what he meant about the equity component? And, um, you know, I'm assuming you were referring to the, to the rollover equity yeah. And how, you know, how, what you've seen in terms of, you know, when does that second, how often does that second bite of the apple happen and, um, and how valuable can it be sometimes? Yeah, I mean, they're happening with greater and greater frequency. You know, I think that, uh, you know, four or five years ago, there were examples of it, right? But the rush to consolidation and the move into MSOs, we're starting really now to see a, a fairly steady pace of second bites. And uh, to the extent that you're able to structure a transaction where, there's a realistic potential for gain on that transaction as a physician. You, know, you not only monetized at some level uh, initially, you improved your practice because you got professional management, presumably you grew it, and now you're ready to sell that platform or a portion of it to another buyer. And I think it's just a great alignment of incentives, you know, um, physicians doing what they do well and, and the business folks doing what they do well, just working together. And how long, I guess, from transaction one to transaction two is usually a reasonable period of time for uh, a seller to, you know, think is reasonable. <laughs> you know, probably Bob Wright is, you, you might see some uh, towards the end of a fun life on the, you know, 18 months, but most of them probably like four or five years, five, six years, something in that range. It takes a while. Yeah, I, I generally see the, the P, the private equity uh, folks tell their their LPs, their limited partners that put up their capital, you know, hey, we, we focus on a five year, 
but you know, it, 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 I, I think three years is probably the two and a half, three years is the soonest I've ever seen. And, you know, there's one, seven, eight, nine years that'll probably never get to a second bite. So. Yeah. Not all will succeed, right? That's a good point. Not all of them will happen. You have to be careful. You know, it's not just the money and the rollover. It's who you pick in as a partner Then are they going to be able to execute, you know? A good point. Thank you. That's all very interesting to me. Um, I'll go back to Bob. What specialties do you think are getting the most attention, uh, you know, of buyers uh, in practices and, and, and ASCs? So on the, <clears throat> on the practices side, um, the normal ones that we've seen, you know, the last two, three years are, are getting a lot of attention. And, and, and again, probably the one, one of the main reasons why, and I'm talking about the, the ophthalmology, GI, um, uh, orthopedics, pain management, um, uh, derm. Um, and I think the reason, one of the reasons why is there's a lot of those platforms out there. And so the platforms have to grow and continue to do deals. So I think that creates more incentive in, in those specialties. Uh, the, the, the big talk in the last probably year or so has been with cardiology, you know, is a new specialty. And I think that's just you know, it's just starting to, to scratch the surface. Um, what, you know, what'll happen after that? I hear, um, I, I, we're not, we haven't really been involved in behavioral, but I hear there's a big, uh, you know, there's going to, that's going to be another one uh, to come in. Um, dental is one we're not involved in, but I think that's still got, in specialty dental, I think has got, uh, you know, a lot of new opportunity. Um, <clears throat> but, it, but, it, but primary care specifically, as Matt had mentioned, there's, you know, the, 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 there's an, a huge interest in it right now because of Medicare Advantage patients primarily, and just the crazy, you know, just absolutely you know, frenzy for uh, the bigger primary care groups. I mean, but that's going to, you know, that'll play itself out, I think. Uh, yeah, there aren't that many of them. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, what about, so how does um, urgent care factor into that? Do you, do you sort of lump that in with, um, with primary care? Or is that a whole separate? No, it's a very different business, you know. Um, it's very different business, valued differently. Um, and I, I think urgent care is just, uh, and it's been around a while, right? There's been some roll-up plays 10 years ago in, in urgent care that were wildly successful. But um, it just shows that, in, you know, in certain markets, um, you know, they, they are either aren't saturated or you have a player who understands the retail aspect of that business really well and is, and is just able to clean up no matter how many people are in the market. Um, and so it's an interesting business, but yeah, different, dy different dynamic, you know. Um, generally, and I, and we touched on this a little bit, but, um, looking at the different specialties are multi-specialty or, or single specialty groups more, um, of more interest to buyers and, and especially with surgery centers, um, you know, I've always heard that if you have too many specialties going on in one center, your overhead is 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 not sustainable because you know you need seven different types of equipment and things like that. Um, and are there groupings of specialties that work well together uh, in terms of efficiencies? Um, I'll go back to Matt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm still in the ASC business, right? And and I think it's all about execution. Um, we've had some of our most successful facilities have had eight specialties, but um, thanks to people other than me in my company who are excellent clinicians and nurses, uh, they're able to, to make sure everything that's added is incremental. So, I mean, to the extent that your absolute overhead number goes up, well, you know, logically it will, but as a percentage of revenue, it, it, you should be amortizing and, and dropping down. So I, I'd add a buyer of the multi-single um, you know, listen, we've done ortho only facilities in GI. They had so much volume that they filled the place up and they're hyper efficient because they do one thing every day. But I, I think if you have a multi that has a sustainable income stream uh, and is well run, uh, I, I'm not seeing any difference in value there, really. Um, and in practices, you know, it's hard to find big integrated multi specialty practices at the same you know, rate as you find uh, single specialty practices. When you do find them, they tend to be larger. Um, and they're very valuable. So I, I think it's a kind of case by case basis. I mean, can you complicate the hell out of something by adding more to it? Sure, but it's certainly possible to do in this business. Um, 
Bob, would your experience in terms of private equity buyers, is it typically single specialty The you know, the, the focus is on orthopedics or, and is it because those private equity groups only deal in certain specialties or they only deal in the specialties that are, you know, the most profitable? Yeah, I mean, probably yes to all that, but it is, is, is a little bit more color. The, the, you know, the typical private equity firm, they start with a thesis, you know, that's how they, how they, and they, they, they do a whole bunch of research and figure out that, okay, for, you know, for this reason, this reason, this reason, we want to go into, you know, cardiology. Okay. Um, and then they'll, you know, it, 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 then it takes a lot of, you know, they need to spend a lot of time and find a platform in cardiology and then get into it. And it's a, it's a, it's a long process. So the shotgun, more a shotgun approach to where we're interested in any deal, you know, any doctor deal, regardless of the specialty, I don't think that, you know, I, I at least I, I, I haven't dealt with any private equity firms that have that strategy so that i think i think they're trying to focus on a thesis you know a value creation thesis that'll get them as we as we said earlier with that five, you know that five year plan because remember the private equity firm that comes in and does a platform in you know orthopedics gi whatever it is their sole goal is that you know at some point four or five six whatever years down the road they want to cash out and they want to produce the highest return to their limited partners period and so I think they're and they're and and they're very very smart folks that are in the private equity world. And I think they're you know they're because of that they're it's just it 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 defaults back to a you know don't shoot too wide and you know keep your focus as narrow as possible. You know uh, one thing I'll throw in uh we were talking a minute ago about cardiology and mental health. The, the first two deals in the history of our company where we're rolling uh, equity. Our fee into equity, like we're not taking the cash, our, our, is a cardiology deal and a mental health. Uh, I, I believe in both of those. And not that I don't believe in the others, but these two just really stood out as being early enough stage and well managed that, uh, you know, it was just something that we had the opportunity to do. Thankfully, they allowed us. And um, I'm not sure we'd do that for every deal, you know. We wouldn't. <laughs> um, so we've, we've, basically focused on consolidation um, most of this time here, but uh, because of the migration of so many different procedures into surgery centers, is there still um, an appetite for building, building new? Um, are you seeing that happening with physician groups or even hospitals or as joint ventures between physicians and hospitals? Um, I will start with you, Matt. Yeah, so in our ASC company, um, our last uh, four and next two to three will be with health systems that are moving cases into surgery centers. Um, in my neck of the woods, which is the Northeast, it'd be extremely difficult to find a independent group of physicians that has enough volume to do a center that isn't already in a center. So that's where our growth is coming from. And then of course, in some of your more progressive states, and when I say that, I, I don't mean you know necessarily better, but just states that are a little bit more uh, accepting of something new, you, you might see you know higher acuity cases like you know right-sided ablations or stents being done. It's going to take a while to seep into the Northeast, I suspect, but uh, it's coming, and that's going to drive new centers. But uh, like I said, you know, there's when there's six thousand centers, there won't be six thousand more. Probably be about six thousand as some fade away. The ones that were set up in an out of network model or didn't have good succession plans. Um, you know, there'll be as many being created as, as, as kind of fading away, but I don't see, you know, seven or 8,000. I don't see that happening. Is that similar to your experience, Bob? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm interested in hearing Matt uh, because Matt actually, as he said, he does surgery centers, you know, he, he develops them and, and that. And so, you know, he's, he's got that more of that operation side from just doing deals perspective where I come at it. I look at it as what I see on new centers. Yeah, exactly that. The new centers are, are, are oftentimes in a market, they're the docs, the younger docs that didn't get the big, you know, that the senior partners already maximized that years ago. And they don't have, because, you know, anybody who's, who's taken any of the chips off the table on a surgery center deal has a restrictive covenant, 
right? So they're not going to be able to, unless they go outside of that, they, even if they want to do a new center down the road, you know, across town, they can't. Um, so what you're left with is the younger docs that were employed, you know, employed or, or junior partners when the surgery center deal was done years ago. And now they're not only up and, you know, rocking and rolling from a volume perspective, they don't have a restrictive covenant. So I see those as being the, you know, quote, new centers. Um, in addition to, as Matt said, as the higher acuity stuff comes, you know, continues to come out of the hospital, that creates, you know, a different, uh, a, a need for a, you know, w w potentially a different type of a center. Um, and Bob, how, how does, do you see value-based care playing into demand for physician practices and, and surgery centers? And how do different buyers view value-based care such as hospitals versus private equity? Yeah, so that's the real, in, in my mind, you know, today, tomorrow, you talk about 2022 and 2023, value-based care is the, you know, is the game changer here. And, and again, first from a practice perspective, right? As, as, as Matt and I said earlier on the primary care side, you know, the big primary care practices, especially those that have a lot of, of, of the medical advantage, Medicare advantage, they're already gone. They've already been paid, you know, nosebleed prices and, and they've, they've done those deals. So there's not that many of those left. What we seem to now as a focus at Bloom, what we're focused on a lot, not specifically the physician practices, rather we've gotten into and have clients in the delivery uh, of care, ACOs, um, uh, at risk IPAs, you know, that, because those are, that's the way that value, the value-based care is being delivered now, um, in some markets. Um, but then the other, the other thing so interesting about value-based care is up in the Northeast where, where, where Matt is in that, you know, it's talked about, there's a little bit of it going on, but it's nothing like what you see out West, you know, out West, it is a, they are in it, you know, there's a lot of markets out West that they are in it completely. And when I say in it completely, what I mean by that from the physician, again, only from the physician perspective, um, it's such a change in mindset, you know, when they are into, when they are, when they are heavy into the value-based care thing, they are getting paid more by not doing as much. And, you know, that is a, you know, that is a paradigm shift that is all it, and it, and it, and it, and it falls to the young physicians, you know, the older physicians that are on their way, you know, my age and, and higher that are on their way out, they will never get to the idea that, wait a minute, the amount of money you make isn't how hard you work and how many, how many patients you see and how many cases you do. Um, and so that whole dynamic is really, you know, changing things. And, and again, I don't know how it, it's very, you know, sophisticated and complicated, which again, I like that, you know, Kim, as you guys do too, the, 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 the really strong law firms like Garfunkel and that, that, that have that expertise and be able to do those types of transactions, there's demand, right? And that demand's going to, you know, hold out for, I, I think, many years, but how it's going to evolve and what it's going to look like as, you know, as it, as it gets further down the, down the road you know, no question. But again, to me, that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, sorry for the long winded <laughs> answer on that, but it's all it's all right. And, and, and especially on uh, the comment about where it's really you know, being uh, where it's prevalent, the West Coast and our only IPA clients are on the West Coast. And there's that's not a coincidence. <laughs> you know, that, that's just because they are that's where they uh, that's where this is being done. But the the fee for service model is deeply flawed. It really is. I mean, it does not. How does that really incent quality versus quantity? And it's just something that we have to just, you know, be cognizant of, uh, of as, as we look to change the system collectively, right? That, that moving to value-based care uh, in this particular business and healthcare is better for patients and it's going to be better for the cost curve. And to the extent that you are pushing uh, towards those directions, it's going to be valuable to, you know, folks that are looking to accelerate that trend by investing in it. Okay, thank you both. I wanna ask you one last question. Um, what is one piece of advice, I'll go back to Bob for now, that you would give to physician practices and ASCs related to the future of healthcare transactions? Advice to the to docs, right, on that? Yes. Um, I, I think it would be that you, you know, a, 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 an acronym that I always use, um, ABP, always be planning. 
you know, I, and, and again, I, I don't know that that, that, that that I think it's very important today and will be tomorrow because you don't know where things are going. But in my in, in my experience, the, the, the really successful physicians um, are the ones that are always doing that, you know, it, it, when they're done, when they're driving home after after surgery or after seeing patients, they're thinking, you know, what's you know, what's what's the what's the what, what's the market, you know, my market going to look like next year? You know, what about this? What about that? I, and those are the ones that um, I think are, are, you know, always the, the most successful, regardless of what the methodology on the delivery of care is. Uh, and so I always encourage, especially the young physicians to spend an appropriate time, they don't teach that in medical school, but spend an appropriate time, amount of time, thinking about those, talking to people, reaching out and trying to educate yourself because it'll pay, it'll pay huge dividends in the long run. Yes, I agree. You know, um, none of us know everything. You know, having no plan is, is not a plan. Um, a wise philosopher once said, everyone's got a game plan until they, they get punched in the face. And that, that was Mike Tyson. And I, I think what, what he means by that in, 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 a, in a healthcare context is that uh, don't let a payer clobber you. Don't let a competitor clobber you by being you know, ahead of you on value-based care, by being ahead of you on growing their platform in a, in a, in a, in a you know, cost-efficient manner. Uh, educate yourselves. None of us are born with this knowledge in our head. Uh, we have to go out and we have to actively seek it. Um, I guess the only thing that I would add is, is I wouldn't be in a mad rush to or panic. I don't think there's need to panic, but change is afoot uh, and it will occur for everyone. And the sooner you're you know, comfortable with a, with a, with a plan um, that makes sense, the, the better, you know. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, you're obviously both very knowledgeable in this area and um, I, we very much appreciate your participation. Um, thank you to everyone who is uh, joining us today, and we hope that you'll uh, come back for our live Q&A. Um, and obviously, you can reach out to any one of us directly with any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Kim.